Well, hey, MANA Online, thanks for tuning in. Welcome, we're so glad to have you. We're excited for today. Later on, we're gonna be taking communion together as a church family. So if you have something to eat, something to drink, go ahead and grab that now. Right after worship, we'll take that together. But for right now, let's go ahead and posture our hearts, get ready to worship our Lord together as MANA Worship leads us in a few songs. MANA, how you doing? Awesome, awesome. Let's worship our God together. Him died. 
Say 
Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the price that you paid for us on the cross. We love you so much. We worship you. We honor you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, if you go ahead and grab whatever you have with you, we're going to take communion together. You know, when Jesus was with us, he left us with a few traditions. This is one of them. This is one of the sacraments we observe as believers, and we call it communion. We're remembering the work of Jesus on the cross, and we're claiming that in our present reality and looking forward to a day that we can spend eternity with him. So if you're a follower of Jesus, I want to invite you to participate with us. Go ahead and grab whatever you have to eat. Maybe it's a wafer, maybe it's a a muffin or a cracker, it doesn't matter, but it represents the body of Christ that was broken for us. So let's pray. Lord, we come to you now. God, thank you for sending your son for us. Thank you for for paying the price, for redeeming us. And, And Jesus, thank you for your body that was broken. Thank you for living a perfect life and dying a perfect death on our behalf. Jesus, we we recognize that you bore stripes on your back so that we may be healed. Your body was broken so that we could experience wholeness. So Lord, we thank you for that. We also claim that and we take this in remembrance of you. Go ahead and eat whatever you have. You know, in the same way, maybe you've got some juice or water, coffee, whatever you have available there. But what it represents is the blood of Jesus that was shed for you and me. So let's pray. God, we we do thank you again for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you for shedding your blood for us. Lord, we know that your word says there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. But thank you, Jesus, that you paid it all. There's nothing left for us to do. Every work you have accomplished, you accomplished it throughout your life and on the cross. You paid that price for us. Jesus, we take this in remembrance of you. Go ahead and drink whatever you have. Now, Lord, we look forward to the day that we can spend eternity with you. We're so grateful for this new covenant that we have, this covenant of grace. We place our faith in you. We not just remember what you've done, but we look forward to the future realities that we can experience because of what you've done for us. But now, Lord, we don't just sit on our hands. We say yes and amen to everything that you have for us as your body, as your church. May we forcefully advance your kingdom everywhere we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for participating in communion with us. I want to say welcome, especially if this is your first time tuning in. If you've never tuned into Mana Online before, it's so good to have you. In fact, we'd love to get to know you a little better, see how we can serve you best. So do us a favor, if that's you, even if you need to pause the video, text the word guest to the number that's on the screen. We'd love to hear from you, see how we can serve you. Also, if you came prepared to give, we have a couple of easy ways you can do that. You can always give at our website, mana.church, or you can even download the Mana Church app on your smartphone, give through that, or you can even text the word MANA to the number that's on the screen. If you prefer to send us something in the mail, you can look up our Cliffdale site location on our website, send it to the address listed there. But that's all I have for right now. We're excited for this sermon series. We're in part four of the sermon series called The Plan. But first, check out these video announcements. Hey there, Man of Church. I'm Chris, this is my lovely wife, Rachel, and we're so excited to let you know all about Easter at Man of this year. The reason that we celebrate Easter every year never changes. Jesus got up. But our heart every Easter season is to approach that truth through various lenses and guide you through different experiences that lead up to Easter Sunday morning. Every year we have our Monday Thursday services along with our Good Friday services and finally our Easter Sunday services. Our Easter week, Passion Week, is designed to help you see Jesus, to see the work that Jesus did, to see the path that Jesus took in the final week of his life through different little glimpses illuminated through scripture. So we hope that you'll make plans to join us all week for Easter at Manna.
Hello, I'm Samuel Fletcher, and I'm one of the staff members of the Experience College Internship. The Experience is a ministry program that's designed to equip college-age students with the tools to walk into their next God-given assignment. We specialize in equipping college students who feel a call to full-time vocational ministry. If you feel a call to full-time vocational ministry, or you feel challenged to strengthen yourself in the areas of faith, character, and leadership, then I highly encourage you to join us for our Experience College Internship Info Night, which will take place on March 24th from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. at our Cliffdale site. This is a free-floating event with snacks and drinks, and you'll be able to interact with faculty from Mana University and The Experience to get more information about the program. So we hope to see you there. So about three or four years ago, when we were leaving uh, the Rayford site here, uh, we were called to PCS uh, to Fort Bliss, Texas. Um, and Pastor Nickertal asked us if we had thought about uh, planting a micro site. You know, and my wife and I discussed it and we prayed about it. Um, and honestly, it was a little scary, but we took that step of faith in God um, and we, we planted the micro site. I absolutely enjoy being here. I love reconnecting with some of the leaders. I love being able to get a new perspective on some of the things that we think we already know about. But if you have any questions at all about who we are, what God has called us to do, and where he's called us to go, the Multiply Conference is for you because you can hear from the people that are there, the real experiences and the real life change that happens when you walk in what God has called you to do. The basic building block of society is a human being, made in the image of God, placed on the earth for a specific time and imbued with gifts, talents, and abilities that when used with others, creates the dance that we call life. What up, everybody? I want to welcome each and every one of you, wherever you're joining us right now, whether you're right here in this room with me or wherever you are on the other end of that camera. Hello to our great, amazing micro sites, our city sites, everybody all along the military highway. Hello and good day to you in the Mana Church, Fayetteville, Fort Liberty region at our amazing multi-sites. And if you're joining us from Mana Online, YouTube, you just stumbled across it. Maybe someone's playing this and you're just stuck in the kitchen and they're in the living room. Whatever, can we put our hands together and make them feel welcome? We're in the fourth part of a series of messages that have focused on really the, the broad topic of relationships, but we've focused on the broad topic by studying God's design, God's design for human beings, his design for uh, the relationships of those human beings. We've talked about things from as far ranging as friendship to marriage, and today we're gonna talk about the result of some of those marriages. So far, we've studied in the books of Genesis and Ephesians, and this is an important bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. When Paul talks about Jesus's relationships with his church, he's using human relationships, yeah. such as marriage, as an example, and he quotes from Genesis 2. He does. So as we've said throughout this entire series, uh, you can stay engaged with us here at Mana Church. We upload these series to YouTube. And in addition to that, we've created another little stream of content on there called uh, Stuff We Didn't Say on Sunday, where we're, we're kind of, we're, we're, we're focusing these sermons on really being explicit about what the Bible has to teach us about relationships and design, and then kind of reserving some of our own opinion and even more specific interpretations for that space. So you can, you can uh, subscribe on YouTube. You can follow along social media. They'll post that out and you can comment and maybe tell us what you liked or what you want to hear more of. Actually, can I bring that up really fast and ask? I asked during the podcast, do you guys think that grits counts as a hot cereal? No. Grits. No. Whoa. I did hear one quick. yes. I have, been, I, have, I have been really perplexed by that idea of grits as a, a cereal. We, I like grits too. I, I'm not like... I'm not sure. We tried to go on a breakfast date and like that turned into a thing. The waitress was asking the people in the back and Rachel and I were like, you know, we were 
arguing yeah. there at, as to whether or not that was a hot funny. cereal. And I was like, funny. you know, my grandmother's in heaven and she knows. And it, it's anyway. Anyway. Anyway, so we have, <laughs> back, to, back to you right here. Yeah. We've discussed human design, relationships, and how to marriage, even if you're not. Mm. Today we are talking about children. Children's. Children. Everyone here is someone's child, mm. and some people have children. So this topic touches all of us. And I believe that children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside and give them a sense, wait, hold on, it's coming to me, of pride. Oh, sing it. No. No, <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. that's okay. Whitney Houston. There's no way I'm gonna even try to come anywhere close to that, no. Well, the Bible has a, a great deal to say about children and being a daughter or son has some pretty cool blessings yeah. for your life. That's good. So we're gonna open our Bibles to the books of, uh, to the book, not the books, to the book, singular, of Genesis. And so as you're doing that, I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 today. So if you want to turn there, I, I want to begin the same way we've kicked off all these, and that's this little series within the series, let me help you understand your Bible. Because G Genesis, Genesis is a really interesting place for people to start. And if I've said this once, I think I've said it probably a hundred times, that you can't read the Bible like it's, like it's the latest fiction thriller. I said earlier uh, in, in a smaller group that you can't read it like a John Grisham novel, but I'm told apparently that that's not like, I haven't read fiction in forever, and that proves quite how yeah. old I am. I don't know who a good fiction writer is, but anyway, anyway. <laughs> Um, the Bible, we, we here at Manor Church believe that the Bible is the handbook for life. It is the divinely inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit to teach us today. It is authoritative today. It's just as authoritative as when the Holy Spirit inspired it. And so we approach the Bible by going to the Bible, not trying to grab the Bible and bring it to us. And there's a few places where you might trip when you first start studying the Bible. You might think, well, the, the Bible's a textbook. The Bible's not a textbook. The Bible's not a science book. The Bible's not a history book. The Bible's not a biology book. I mean, it contains all those things, but that's not what it's written to be, so you can't study it like that's what's happening in it. And for the sake of, for the sake of Bible study, and I've, I know I've said this a lot, but I, I really, I, the, the more you, you, know, you repeat something so much so you, you, you show people the weight that you want to put on it, I really want to challenge you when you start in Bible study, start by asking the question, why did God do this? Why is this here? What, why, is, why is God doing this? Why is God saying this? Why is God teaching this? Why, before we start trying to wrestle or wrap our arms around what exactly is going on. I know in our, in our Western, you know, very 21st century minds, we want to go immediately to what before we start dealing with why, but it's really important that we keep that order the same there. All right, I'm going to begin in Genesis chapter 1. But before I do that, I want to kind of catch you up a little bit on what's happened in Genesis chapter 1. I talked about this in the first week, but creation is an act. Creation is a deliberate act of God. In the midst of nothing, God spoke and there was something. I say that because I want to highlight to you right from the very beginning, before we start talking about any other relational anything, God stepped towards you first. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God moved first in the beginning. So what's happening is, is he's creating, he's, he's speaking and things are unfurling. It's amazing, it's incredible. And then he uses his hands. He creates man and woman. He creates them in his image. He creates them by his design. He creates them on purpose. He chooses, he is the author of life. And now humankind has been created by hand and he does something he doesn't do any other place in the creation narrative. He breathes his life into their nostrils. And then comes the command. So I'm going to start reading today in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we looked at this verse in the first week, but I'm revisiting it because I want to I want to place particular emphasis on three words. Now, I've heard this verse preached a bunch. I'm the oldest son of Pastor Michael 
Paul Fletcher, which means this verse and the first three chapters of Genesis are all about the kingdom. And I know they're about the kingdom. And I know how, I know how deeply they matter for your kingdom perspective. But I'm going to focus on three words that we don't often focus on when we teach Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. I'm going to focus on fruitful, multiply, and fill. Now, when I talk about fruitful, I'm going to talk about having children. And in case that conversation triggers some feelings in you, I want to encourage you to ride this conversation out because Ray and I have uh, in our story not been unscathed by this topic of struggling to have children, losing children, and we've walked the, with, with some friends through the, uh, the journey of adoption and the myriad of ways that God uses the miracle of children born inside and outside your home to fulfill his plan on the earth. So what we're not going to preach is we're not about to preach a narrow view or a narrow understanding, but we have to start with God's original intent and bring nuance to the equation after we understand God's original intent. Ray said that last week, and I started thinking about it because when, when you think about it, especially when you think about it with the topic of kids, like that seems, nuance seems to be kids' superpowers. You know what I mean? <laughs> like there's the very clear direction from parents and then there's the nuance that kids try to, you know, play with. Me, for example. We'll talk about me for a second. Um, I was born in the 80s before cell phones. And see, back when I was a kid, my parents used to give us this thing called a curfew that I feel like my kids' generation knows nothing about. My kids' generation are like, whoa, you know, I'm going to go summertime in Madrid and London real quick. And it's like, whoa, what? what? <laughs> My parents were like, be home by nine or you're grounded for eternity, you know? Yeah. I was actually, I, was, I went on this rant one, this last couple weeks ago. We were in Charlotte for Jaden's soccer tournament, and we drove past this Wendy's that brought back to memory this moment when I tried to nuance my parents. So my friend, you got to be careful how you choose your friends. So I have this friend named Jeff. Christensen. <laughs> Pastor Jeff Christensen. He's barely saved now. He was not even close to remotely saved then. Oh. We went to a concert. It was a, it was a day-long festival in Charlotte, and I'm like 98% sure. I told him, my dad said I had to be home by nine. Well, he was driving. He says lies. He doesn't say lies. I'm talking. I got the mic. So the day goes on, and we're starting to drive home, and I'm like, dude, I am in trouble. My dad said we got to be home by 9, and Jeff's like, we got to stop at Wendy's. And I was like, I got a golden ticket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So at curfew time, we're in the drive through in Wendy's, and so we got home like at midnight. My dad said to be home by 9. I was like, well, Jeff had to stop at Wendy's. Yeah, three-hour stop yeah. at Wendy's. He eats slowly. You know what I mean? Anyway, anyway, it's a ridiculous way to illustrate truth before nuance. So let's go, I think we should probably go, go back, back to, to the, the, to the let's go back to the scriptures. I'm going to stop talking for a minute. <laughs> so be fruitful in Hebrew is literally translated to have children. Mm. The first command that the Lord gives his creation is to replicate themselves in other humans. And this has some weight in our society. The Bible actually teaches that we should get married, that we should have children. Proverbs says that children are a blessing. This is God's plan for his people to reproduce other people. Why are you laughing? <laughs> they, are, they are a blessing. Sometimes oh, the blessing seems like it's disguised blessing. and the blessing smells like poop. But sometimes, you know, they're, they're a blessing most of the time. They're a blessing. They are a blessing. This is God's plan for his people to reproduce other people in a way of experiencing his blessing. That's good. Nowhere will the Bible teach you that you should have children and never stop having children. <laughs> Just that bearing fruit was and it is the design. <laughs> My parents did not read that verse. <laughs> they started having children and just kept on having children. I'm so glad they did. I'm so glad. I love them. Anyway. But I came first. They could have stopped. You did come first. <laughs> I don't know. It's not profitable. Oh my goodness. So <laughs> bearing fruit was, and it is the design. Mm. So we're aware that this presents a challenge for those who can't have children. And it's a little bit early to jump to Ephesians, but I'm going to for just one second. You don't need to turn there. Um, Ephesians 1.5 says that Jesus was sent to take our place so that we could be adopted as sons and daughters of God. So adoption is and was God's plan for the restoration of what sin broke. And we'll come back to this later. But the, the, the theology of adoption is God's plan, and it's a good plan. Yeah. I love that you said that. I love that you said that that way, theology of adoption. And you kind of illustrated the point that I was making a second ago. The Bible isn't teaching biology. 
It contains biology, but the important thing to work out here is the Bible's not gonna end on just physically reproducing offspring. Because the second word of these three that I'm highlighting, fruitful, and the second word is multiply. Now this one, this one we teach a lot at Mana Church because we believe that it's God's math. And we believe that when God gave the promise to Abraham, that, that, that if you can number the stars in the sky, so shall your descendants be. We believe that he was talking about uh, the descendants of his people. At the same time, he's talking about those of us who were grafted into the faith. And so we, we talk about multiply as God's math, but, but in, in this context, his intention is that through his people having children and, and making disciples, both of those children but also of other disciples, that they would grow and they would grow greater and greater on the earth. So this, this, word, this way that he's using this word here, multiply, is implying this idea of a generational transfer. If God's first statement to humankind is biological, have offspring, the second statement is not. He's saying transfer what you have to the generation that comes after you. Now, parenting and generational transfer are um, intimidating. It feels intimidating. I remember the moment we brought our oldest son home and closed the door, and I thought, there's no like on-call nurse switch. Like, I need, I don't know what to he do. come with a button. It feels so intimidating. The thing is, this is the foundation of parenting. Take the wisdom, Take the walk with God, take the resources, take the advice, take everything that you've been given by God and transfer that to them. So Proverbs 22, verse six says, train up a child in the way they should go. Even when they are old, they will not depart from it. So there's something that is happening here. As Christopher said last week, you have to take action on purpose. In order for this to work, in order for you to train your children, it's gonna require that you think, that you plan, and that you take deliberate action on purpose in order to, to train the children. Mm -hmm. And this is where it's key to follow what God's calling us to do. So step one, biologically replicate or grow our families through adoption. And step two, then you need to transfer and empower the next generation. They're both part of the equation. Don't just have children, but train Oof, children. Oof, that's good. Don't just have children, train children. This is why Christopher said what he said a minute ago, how parenting doesn't end with actually just having mm. the child. The ability to engage in biology is not the end of parenting. That's right. The third word is fill. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. God's plan from the beginning was always to create a people for himself to create a species in his image, to create people, and then to place them on the earth to then reflect his glory and spread his glory. That was his plan. That was his plan from the jump. And th th this word fill is interesting because it's also used in places in the Old Testament where it talks about the consecration of, or uh, the consecrated process of ordaining priests. So filling the earth, what, what's he saying? A people who are becoming consecrated, who are different, who are set apart, who are flowing against the default setting. We talked about default setting a number of times. Default setting is me, myself, I. That's my natural default setting. And so what, what God is doing is placing a people on the planet who are gonna demonstrate a different and better way. So I think the text has given us what we're calling the threefold plan for parenting. The first is be fruitful. So what are you, what are you saying? Listen, I, I'm saying the Bible, the Bible is pretty clear. Some people are given the gift of celibacy. I understand that not everyone is gonna marry. I get that. But what is the Bible saying? The Bible is actually saying it's good for you to marry. And then it's good to what? Have kids. It's good to have some. It's good to adopt some. Be in a family relationship. Now, let me talk, let me talk about you in the relationship for a second. Whether your physical father or mother are your spiritual father or mother. You need, needed both in the past and you need both now. And this is, this is on us who are parents and on us who are children. You know, you can't decide to be born, but you can decide to embrace parenting even if it's not done well. You can make a choice. L let, me, let, me say, let me say really, really quickly uh, on this, on adoption, because Ray, Ray said we we're going to say something real quick about the theology of adoption. You know, the, the, the concept of adoption as practiced in the Roman world was really, really powerful. Because um, it, was, it was a practice of the first century. If a Roman family did not want the child, they would carry the child to term and then just 
toss the child out. It's called infanticide is what it was called. So the Christians would come and adopt these children, take them into their home. They would raise them as believers. The thing about the concept of adoption, though, that's so earth-shattering is that in Roman culture, you could disinherit a natural-born child. You could have a child and go, you know what? So-and-so is a turkey, and I don't like this child, and I'm going to therefore disinherit this child. But a child you had adopted was your child for life. So when Paul talks about this concept of adoption, and really I think the beauty of of this Christian idea of adoption, it really begins with the Christians and really is formulated in the first century where this idea is that I'm going to choose to step in and take the place of someone who didn't do this right, and I am yours and you are mine for life. And it's a really, really deep and beautiful and powerful idea. That's good. Number two, multiply. Multiply. So we're talking about generational transfer. However those children came into our home, it is our job um, to be the primary providers of uh, wisdom, protection, provision, care, et cetera, covering all of that. Generational transfer doesn't mean that you, the parent, have to know everything. Thank God. Um, Actually, I think becoming a parent is when you realize, oh my goodness, you don't know anything. Then they turn... Then they turn to teenagers. And then your teenagers like to remind you that you also don't know anything. You know nothing. <laughs> you don't also, know you've never been like. this age before. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's the great thing. <laughs> Generational transfer doesn't mean that you have to know everything, yeah. but you're the one making sure that learning is happening, that uh, we're consistently yeah, 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 learning. Yeah, 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 so yeah. This changes as they mature, and literally eating food is is a great example. My mom, my, my mom used to say, or my mom has actually told me, Christopher, it's not your job to feed everybody. It is your job to make sure they eat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Write that down. Words of advice good. by Laura. <laughs> I'm going to write a book full of things mom said. That'd be great. Yeah. So let's talk about eating. Food. I was in trouble a lot, so I know a lot of things that mom said. <laughs> A lot. John, does, John knows nothing of what mom said. John was perfect, born perfect. I was born, I don't know. I think be the foil. perfect. All right, so let's talk about eating food. <laughs> eating food is a good object lesson. Eating food so, is a good object when lesson. When they're little, little babies. Yeah. Um, you're the one who's literally putting food into their mouths. You know that first bite, a lot of times they're going like, to you know, gag it up. or you know, But you are training them that food is important. After a few bites, they're going to think, hey, first of all, maybe I like this. Secondly, it's making my tummy feel better. I will never forget. Jaden used to watch Yo Gabba Gabba when he was a little oh. boy. And they, oh. were always, they were always like, try it, you'll <laughs> like it, like to convince kids song, to eat yeah, food. Yeah. So we had him at the table one time, and he took a bite of it, the food or whatever, and he looked up and said, I tried it. I didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> He was two. Actually. Well, that backfired. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so anyway, when they get older, they might learn th- to put the spoon into their mouths. But you're the one cooking, setting the table, everything else. You're not training meal preparation yet, but you're training them how to put the food into their mouths. Then they start setting the table and feeding themselves and even helping with cleanup, which is amazing. Mm. But you're still the one cooking. You're training them how to be responsible. They, they are learning responsibilities now. And then lastly, they can do the whole meal. They can cook, even if it is just hamburger helper. That was the first meal that I learned how to cook, mm. hamburger helper. And I think I made it like three times a week because I was so proud of myself I could cook hamburger helper. Wow. <laughs> anyway, so you're- you, you grew up with health nuts. Yes. Yeah, good. <laughs> Big time. Yeah, love it. <laughs> so, so you're teaching your child that they can cook the whole meal. They're, they're cooking. They're not just feeding themselves, but they're preparing it all. They're cleaning it up. They are now entering the place where they, are, they have to start participating in providing for themselves. What you're doing here is an object lesson of how we walk through this process of recognizing that we're, it, it's almost like we're learning with our children. Part, part, yeah. of, part of child it rearing is, is parent rearing. It's yeah. like... Yeah, we're, we're learning as we go. It sounds very simple, doesn't it? it yeah, it does sound simple. It sounds very, very simple. It does sound simple, and I, I said this to you earlier, but I remember when we started talking about like the kids and how to raise them and whatnot, it does sound simple, and at the same time, what we've discovered along the way, and we're by no means done and or experts, yeah. right? Like, I mean, our kids could, you know, I don't know, grow up and start a Ponzi scheme. Who knows? Um, <laughs> They could be online cyber criminals. You never know. Probably not, but you know, um, is the number of times that that we would bump into challenges and things would change and we would adapt as we went along. So, yeah. 
So that's what we mean when we say multiply or generational transfer. Yeah. So under this point, uh, let's, let's jump in scripture. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 6 because generational transfer is a two-sided coin. There's the giving side, which Rachel just kind of, uh, in a very clever way, illustrated with the idea of helping children through the process of learning how to feed themselves to eventually learning to sustain themselves with food. Uh, but there's a two-sided coin. There's the giving side, which, which she just talked about. But there's also the receiving side of this coin. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. There's lots of, there are lots of key words in here, but let me go through a few of them in, in, kind, of, in kind of short order. The first is children. Now, when Paul's talking to children, believe it or not, what Paul's not doing is going, cut this part of the letter out and read it in Sunday school. Like, that's not what's happening. This is read to everybody. Because what he's, what he's saying when he's talking to children is this, is this is all of us. We're all somebody's son and somebody's daughter. Now, the rest of this is going to hit a little bit differently based on where you are in the age sort of range situation. But he says children. The second word is obey. Now, there's an implication, there's an implication with this word. It's actually a twofold action. This word obey is, obey is a twofold action. The first is to hear, and the second is to act. Hear and act. If I if I can get if I can get really, 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 really real, this hits differently based on where you are. So if you are living under your parents' authority, what does it mean to be living under your parents' authority? And I'm going to upset some of my siblings, but that's okay. I'm going to go for it. The Christopher Fletcher definition for being living in your own home and like establishing your own authority is when that bill, sh- how many bills are you paying, Annie? The answer is none. You're still under mom and dad's authority. I don't care where you're living, but if that bill shows up and you're not the one primarily responsible to pay for it, <laughs> you know what I mean? I remember bumping. <laughs> it, I, look, look, I love college freshmen. They're awesome. But at the same time, it's like, well, I moved out of mom and dad's house. No, you didn't. You're living at college. Not quite the same thing. If you're living under your parents' authority, can I give you what this verse is telling you? Obey. I, just do it. Obey your parents. But then... Are you an adult? Have you aged out of the I live under my parents' authority? Then there's a twofold equation here. Hear and act. Listen to them. We're mostly fully grown. Her more than me. <laughs> I'm on the way. She's fully grown. But the thing here is to 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 hear your parents, to listen, to listen to your parents is uh, it's for all of us. Now, I know, I know that that hits based on, on your relationship with your parents and how that went, how they, but don't worry, it's going to get heavier in a second. We're going to talk about honor in a second. It's, the, the Bible's not saying that we have to obey our parents always, but the Bible is saying, no, no, you need, you, need to, you need to listen to them, even if it's just listening to the words. You need to hear them. Then, parents, this Greek word, Paul chooses Greek words on purpose. Paul's a pretty learned character. When he chooses words, he chooses them on purpose, and this word is defined as biological and legal. So children, obey your parents, and then he tells them to honor. Now, here's what honor means. Honor means to show respect. I know, I know that people were raised in homes where your parents are not worthy of respect. I understand that. But honor is more about you than the one you're honoring. Listen to me, especially when they're not worthy of the honor. Mm-hmm. Here's what you're establishing in your life. If you can honor up, regardless of who you're honoring, you are, you are demonstrating that you are a vessel worthy of honor yourself. That's what this word honor, that's what this word honor is all about. And here's the thing, because this is the key. The key is this word promise. Because what you're doing is you're setting yourself up when you honor up, even if parenting was done poorly, when you honor the position, I'm not saying that you give them the position they had in your life. And I'm not saying, there are a lot of times where I go out of my way to say things that I'm not saying. And I think that's an unfortunate sidebar. I think that's an unfortunate uh, byproduct of some societal nonsense. Just because I didn't say something doesn't mean I didn't say the thing I didn't say. 
And we far too often read in things and go, well, if you didn't say this, then you must have meant that. No, just listen to the words I'm saying to you. When you honor up, even if, even if they didn't do it right, and I'm, I'm not saying when you honor up that you give them the place and the standing that they held in your life before they damaged you. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you put yourself back in a position to be hurt. I am saying when you honor, if nothing else, you honor the position of parent. You set yourself up to be someone who can be the receiver of a promise. And listen to me, I told you it's intimidating to be a parent. It's crazy intimidating to be a parent, which is why I need the promise of God in my life. Because I need to bring something to the equation. Generational transfer and being someone who can be led and who freely gives honor sets you up to lead and to receive honor. That's good, good. So the threefold plan for parenting from Genesis, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Parenting never ends, mm. but once they've matured to the point of being on their own, we have to let them go. And not only let them go, but bless them and send them. When we look at this verse in Genesis, a lot of times we only hear the subdue the earth part of the dominion mandate. But before there was subdue, there was fill. That's right. So our job as parents, biological and spiritual, is to fill the earth with a generation of offspring that we've raised up, fruitful, and that we've invested in, multiply, generational transfer, and that we have sent. Mm. Christopher and I, as we've mentioned before, we have four children, and um, as our older kids get to the age where they're gonna be sent, this gets really hard. Ugh. Our oldest son is about to graduate high school, and I, oh, I cannot even believe it. So it's- She's been crying for months. I have been crying for months. We, I am an emotional mess. I could cry I'm right now. I'm starting to wonder if, if the I... problem's me, because she's getting emotional about these kids leaving, like, and then you're stuck with me? Like, is that, <laughs> is that what you're sad about? Like, no, no, no. Maybe I'm the problem. So, <laughs> no, no. No, okay, good. Not at all. But, we got that yeah, out so of the we're, way. So we're at that place in our lives right now where we're facing this, you know, we're gonna, send Jaden out and um, it is hard. But when, yes. we, when we were first married, you know, we started talking about our end. What was our, our end goal with raising children? And so, you know, you have to raise your children in what are the things that you want them you know, for their lives? So you have to keep that in mind. Yeah, recognizing that it, it changes and shifts as you go. When, you, when your kids are two, you've got plans for college. You got plans for college and then yeah. they're 18 and it's like, uh, so, you know, maybe not NASA. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we can afford engineering school. You know, let's, let's dial this back a notch. So before we conclude, um, I want to finish off with just a way too fast overview of some of what the Bible has to say about some really practical do's and don'ts about how to parent God's way. The first is discipline. Proverbs says that a child left to themselves disgraces their parents. Proverbs says to discipline them because by doing that, you give them a future. Our, our, our Ephesians 6 text says to bring children up in the discipline. Some other translation says discipline and instruction. The ESV I read to you today says. Some other translations say the discipline and the fear of the Lord. Here's the thing about discipline. You ready for the, you ready for the hack for discipline? Never discipline in anger. Yes. Never. Never discipline in anger. Most discipline questions center around where's the line, what do you do, what do you not do, what's in, what's out. I have always answered that question by asking, where is your heart? Yeah, so discipline never involves saying mean things to your children or belittling them or speaking curses over their lives, you know, such as like, you never... Um, why are you so difficult? Why are you so difficult? Stop, don't speak a curse over them. No matter how old your children are, it is never okay to speak curses or negative words over our children. Curses are negative words spoken about your children, um, about what you're, what you're seeing in the moment without the faith to see change happen in their lives. That's, That's good. what curses are. So for example, your child comes in late. Sounds familiar? <laughs> I did sow it. I guess I'm reaping it. <laughs> Your child, Hush. <laughs> your child comes in late, speaking curse would sound like you're never on time, you're always late to everything. Mm. Wait a second though, are they late? Yes. yes. Did they disobey? Yes. Yes. But a non-curse response would be like, you were late, I told you not to come home late, and now that there are going to be consequences. Um, one response spoke to what was happening, but didn't outline to the child how they could fix the problem. Mm. And then the other addressed what was happening and basically only focused on this is how we're going to fix this issue. So whatever form of discipline you're using, again, like he mentioned, it is never out of anger. If it's out of anger, it is not right. 
Discipline should be swift and clear, but never out of anger and never for the purpose of damaging your children. That's right. We're disciplining them to mold their wills, not to crush or um, belittle them. That's, that's, a, that's a Michael Fletcherism right there if I ever heard one. We are disciplining to get at the will, not to damage or crush the spirit. And we're not disciplining to modify behavior. So, you know, we talk about in conflict with people, we talk about, you know, don't, don't judge people's motives. Well, if they're little kids, you better as heck judge their motives. <laughs> that's what you're shaping are the motives. You're not, we're not in the behavior modification business. I don't want kids who are really good at basically hiding their curmudgeonery from right. me. I want right. to I wanna get at the heart of the issue. All right. The next point is provision. Matthew has a beautiful passage in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus talks about prayer and he uses parenting as the analogy. Matthew chapter seven, uh, verses nine through 11. Or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now. I know it's an analogy, I get that. But the point is still clear. We provide for our children the way God provides for us. How does God provide for you? Good things, bountifully, not withholding. Can I be be really frank for one second? Be your kid's chief encourager and cheerleader. When I say, uh, when I talk about good things, most people's mind immediately runs to, well, you gotta buy your kids a bunch of good stuff. I'm not saying you don't deny your kids stuff. I am saying that the place where this is the easiest to action is your children are growing up in a world where confidence and verbalized love are in short supply and you should be overflowing with those. Mm -hmm. Absolutely overflowing with with being the, the, look, you be their cheerleader. The world, social media, uh, people on their job, people that bump into them are gonna tell them they don't measure up, they're not good enough, they're not smart enough. Everyone's gonna say that to them. They don't need to hear that from you. You, you, pump, you pump them up. And if I can, for just one second, um, I have one son, so I tell him he's my favorite son. But at the same time, he's my least favorite son. He's like all, it's all, you know, it's all wrapped into one. He can be any, any given moment. I have, I have three daughters. And let, let, me just, let me just say for one teeny tiny bit, tell your children, especially your daughters, that they are smart, that they matter, that their opinion matters, that they're beautiful, and I'm talking about praise their outward appearance. Yes. I hear people all the time talking about, well, you gotta be careful, you don't want your kids to be proud. You know what, you let God worry about their pride and you tell them they're amazing, made on purpose for a purpose, and they can do anything. Yes. That's what they hear yeah. from you. Yeah. So as we've already pointed out in Ephesians 6, it's our job to guide our children. First... This point is guidance. You skipped that. Oh, I did skip that. You did. Guidance. Guidance Guidance is this point, yes. They just got to know to put it up. Okay. Sorry. Boom! (laughs) First in their walk with God. So we're going to guide them in their walk of God first. This means a life of personal devotion and making the fellowship of believers a priority. Mm. So... um, Go ahead. Example, you know, in in kids' ministry or in um, students' students to be with like-minded children their age who can, um, who... You know, I was, we, I we are products of amazing parents. Yes. That's not a question. The thing is, it wasn't just our parents and us all by ourselves. We grew up yes. around people and kids and teenagers who thought like us. Yeah. And so what that empowers your children to be able to do is to find a safe place to normalize walking with Jesus in the really weird place where, you know, I don't know if you remember, those of you who are my age, I don't know if you remember being 16 and 17, but it ain't easy and it didn't get any easier. Right. Yeah. Right. So secondly, we tell them about what God has done in our lives. Mm. From Exodus to the Psalms, the Bible is full of story of God's people telling the next generation all the things um, that God has brought them through, what God did for them. That's right. And thirdly, freely offer advice forever. Just because we don't live in our parents' home, we still ask for their advice. We love their advice, we seek out their advice. And and same with um, older people in the church and uh, more seasoned believers, we need the help and so do you. And when you're saying we, you're not talking about we as in like the proverbial versions of us. Right. Th- that, is, that is our practice. It is. We don't make big life decisions without seeking out advice. Absolutely. Yes, from our parents, our physical parents. At the same time, from people that, that love us and yeah. that have our best interest. And yeah. Yeah. 
So let's, let's put a ribbon on this. Being a parent or being a child is for every single one of us. Every single one of us listening to me right now is called to be fruitful and multiply what they have in the lives of others. And everyone is called to receive from the generation that went ahead of us. Every one of us, regardless of how old you are, every one of us is called to receive from others. We are meant to be disciples, which means what? We are meant to receive discipleship. At the same time, we are called to engage in discipleship by leading and providing for and pouring ourselves out for the generation that comes after us. We here at Mana Church, we call this mentoring and we call this being mentored. We teach this in our growth track. It is the foundational idea of our growth track. It's the way, it's the way that we do church here at Mana Church. It is foundational to small groups because here's the thing. God created you on purpose and for a purpose. When you walk into the room, the presence, the person of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God goes with you. You are known in heaven and feared in hell, and you're placed on the planet for such a time as this. And so when I say those words to you, it's so important for you to be with others who believe the same about you and also believe the same about themselves because what we're, what we're participating in here is this snowball effect of God's plan and God's purpose coming out of our lives in the midst of a time in history, in the midst of a society, in the midst of a world screaming at the top of their lungs for purpose and meaning and calling. Bow your heads. Let me, let me pray for us. I, I want to I wanna finish with, a, with a, just a brief, a brief little challenge. But before I do, you know, at the end of the I Am series, we talked about the presence of God as a person, the person of the Holy Spirit. It's one of our operational principles here at Manor Church. So I think it's appropriate to pause and ask, Holy Spirit, come. Come and minister to us and touch our hearts. I want to finish with a challenge. And the reason I asked... Holy Spirit to come is, I don't want you to do what I tell you to do. I want you to do what he tells you to do. But I want to put the challenge into two camps. I believe we should challenge ourselves to take a step towards our parents. For some of you, that's going to hit a little bit differently. And I want you with the Holy Spirit to work out what he's saying to you when you say that. And and the other challenge, everyone take a step towards your children, even if you don't have them yet. Holy Spirit, we love you. We're your people. Pray that you'd come and speak to us. Come your kingdom, be done your will in our lives on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Keep your head bowed for one more moment, for one more prayer. You know, I, we talked a lot about relationship today, and we talked about uh, uh, relationship with our children and children. We talked about human relationships, but I'm going to tell you something. Human relationships are, are built on the foundation of our relationship with Jesus. The Bible teaches that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which means our default setting is outside of relationship with our creator. And Jesus came and lived a perfect life and died the perfect death and then rose again this that we're going to celebrate on Easter Sunday so that you might have life, both in the life to come and now. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, then I want to lead you in a prayer that's going to set that right. At the same time, though, maybe you're not walking in a relationship with him. Jesus said, I'm the door, I'm the gate. He also said, I'm the way, which means what? You got to have a relationship with him and walk with him. So if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, or you're not currently walking the way with him, with every head bowed and every eye closed, in a second, we're all going to pray a prayer together, both here in this room with me and wherever you're watching right now. If that's you and you go, yeah, that's me, raise your hand and hold it up long enough for me and one of our team members to see it right now. Listen, wherever you're watching this right now, if you want to make that decision to follow Jesus, invite him into your heart and place your faith in him for salvation. We'd love to pray with you. So just repeat after me. If that's you, believe this with all that you have. Say, Jesus, thank you for your love and for your sacrifice. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and for my sins. I repent of my sins. I ask you to save me. Be my Lord and give me faith to follow you 
for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're so excited. If you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, we'd love to hear from you. In fact, do us a favor. If that's you, we want to resource you. Make sure that you have everything you need as you start this journey with Jesus. Text the word Jesus to the number that's on the screen. We really would love to hear from you and celebrate the decision that you just made. All right, man of church, if you'd like prayer in any area of your life, we'd love to stand with you in prayer. We have a team standing by that would love to pray with you. Text the word prayer to the number on the screen. We'd love to do that. We love you guys. God bless, and we'll see you next time.